Okay, it's time. So hopefully uh, everybody's got their breakfast here or already had it. Uh, great night again last night. Thanks to everybody who came to the dinner. Lots of animated, interesting conversations, some of which continued on in the bus later. Hopefully you were at a table that also had an engaged and interesting conversation. So today, uh, we're going to get, as I said, as I promised yesterday, we're going to get in a little more of a geek fest here. We're going to talk uh, more specifically about some of the newer technologies and things we're introducing pretty much all in the digital transformation area. There's a sprinkling of things that also, you know, you could say are more in the conventional kind of automation space, but largely looking at our digital automation portfolio and, and the things that are inside of that. So very uh, full agenda here. Uh, we're going to go even more deeply into talking about analytics. We're going to talk about data management. Some of these are, those are a couple of big topics I touched on yesterday. Uh, Tom's going to give us an update on what's happening in the wireless infrastructure world. Of course, we've been working on that for 13 more or more years now. We have a lot of new technology in upstream oil and gas, also a new uh, cloud-based solution to talk about there. Uh, Derek is going to talk to you about what uh, literally... Uh, on the second day of exchange last year, we first talked to you about, and that's our acquisition in the machine control space. Those of you that were here last year may remember that that happened uh, and was announced while we were here at the exchange, but we really couldn't tell you anything then. Now it's a year later, so we can tell you something, okay? Uh, and then Brad's gonna talk about uh, some of the things we're doing internally to make our experience with customers more digital and more advanced. So we always like to start all of our sessions with a safety moment. Uh, Emerson has 12 uh, life-saving behaviors that we go through. Life-saving behavior number five is know your limitations. Know your limitations and ask for assistance if needed. Something that maybe you more frequently get reminded on is you are part of that certain generation that the innovation guy talked about yesterday that, uh, that still remembers you know, when, thing, when digital was special, as he called it. And I think this is very specifically targeted at our customers here in their digital transformations. If you can't do a job safely, ask for help. We're here to help. Emerson's here to help. Now, this is a chart which, if you've come to any of our press conferences in the last three years, you've seen before. Uh, we do update it periodically as our portfolio gets broader and bigger. Well, and we kind of maybe change some things around a little bit to make it more clear based on feedback we get. Uh, but fundamentally, this is the plant web digital ecosystem, pretty straightforward. You move from data and how we collect the data to how we do analytics and analyze the data, and then the portfolio of services that we have to put that all together and make it real. So today we're going to be talking about a number of things that are on this chart. I'm going to very briefly mention some new things that we're not going to go into in more detail that you can see down at the exhibit in case it's something of, of interest to you. Okay, so Plant Web Insight is you know an analytics package we introduced uh, about three years ago. We continue to expand the portfolio of these asset-specific load and go kind of pre-configured analytics, known answers to known problems as we like to call them. And we have four new applications in that portfolio that you can see if you go down into the plant web or the wireless section of the exhibit. Plant Web Optics, of course, is a, also a platform we introduced about three years ago. Uh, we talked last year about Optics 1.5 coming out, the integration with CMMS, some of the other new features, integration with the historian. Uh, that's released out running down in the exhibition. You're going to hear a little bit about where we're going future direction with plant web optics also this morning. We have a complete uh, exploration and production software suite, so reservoir management, production management with, with all of the subsurface data. Uh, we just did uh, an announcement two weeks ago or so, I believe it was, on how we've ported all of that to the cloud. So our latest and greatest software as a service that's available is our entire digital twin of the subsurface available as a cloud-based offering software as a service. And of course, that kind of software benefits greatly from, from the cloud because it actually needs you know, the extra horsepower and, and expandability of data storage that the cloud provides. So with that, 
just those are just a few things that we're not going to go into more deeply that I thought worth mentioning. If you're interested, as I said, you can see more on them on some of the roadmap sessions or at the exhibit. We're going to dump jump directly into getting into some more detail on some topics. And so first, I'd like to ask Monsi to come up, and she's going to talk to us about our operational analytics portfolio. Monsi? Thank you. I think the mic is... Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Monsi Menon. I'm a product manager for analytics and machine learning. And today I'll be talking about Emerson's operational analytics portfolio. So as our customers move towards this path of digital transformation, they're wanting to move away from more manual to more data-driven and automatic ways. And here's where analytics comes into play in our plant web digital ecosystem. They're wanting to use analytics to look at their data and convert that into meaningful information for an improved plant performance. Now, we introduced our operational analytics solution framework yesterday. In my presentation today, I will be talking about Emerson's offering of principles-driven analytics. I will talk about our new offering of data-driven analytics solution. I will talk about a practical use case of where this data-driven analytics solution is applied, and then talk about asset performance platform that integrates this analytics information together. But first, Let's take a look at how this operational analytics can be applied to a process plant. So while principles-driven analytics helps us with analyzing the most well-understood and common asset type in a process plant, data-driven analytics takes into consideration the interaction of all these assets and process parameters and their impact on the process itself. Now let's take a look at what Emerson has to offer in the operational analytics space. PlanFeb Insight is our easy to deploy, principles driven analytics solution, which has embedded inside of it asset specific fault trees for monitoring the health of the most well known and understood asset types such as steam traps, pressure relief devices, uh, network monitoring, heat exchangers, etc. Our new AMS asset monitor offering is um, our edge analytics device, which has principles-driven analytics embedded inside of it, monitoring assets such as pumps, heat exchangers, blowers, gearboxes, et cetera. Now let me tell you about our new offering of data-driven analytics. Emerson recently acquired industry-leading KNET technology. KNET, or KnowledgeNet, is a data-driven analytics application that combines artificial intelligence and principles-driven analytics to provide key performance indicators. It has a variety of machine learning algorithms that is looking at data being ingested from a variety of data sources, performing pattern recognition, and creating predictive process and asset models. Now let me tell you a practical use case of where KNET can be applied. A debut to Nazar, is a type of a distillation column, which is really important in maintaining a refinery's th throughput. Reed vapor pressure is an important indication of maintaining the efficiency of a debut debutanizer. Now, traditionally, this is calculated in a lab environment where you cannot take into, into account any change in process variations or any change in operating modes. KNET, with its machine learning algorithms, such as neural network and online clustering technique, is able to calculate and predict this read vapor pressure, thus taking into account any variations that the process may undergo. Now, one aspect is prediction. So once your analytics application has predicted an asset or process anomaly, you want to know what the root cause of that issue is. KNET has root cause analysis embedded into its decision trees or fault trees. These fault, fault trees go through several layers of causes and its associated events in a real-time uh, environment, letting you know and pinpointing the true root cause of the asset or process anom anomaly that the application has predicted. Now, Emerson's knowledge 
and subject matter expertise of over 492 failure mode and effect analysis can be embedded into these root cause analysis model. So what, what I just spoke to you about is analytics. Now, an analytics alone doesn't uh, give you a complete picture. You need an asset performance platform to integrate that information together and provide that to a relevant persona for a faster decision making. Yeah, so Peter just talked about PlanFab Optics. PlanFab Optics is our asset performance platform that connects and um, collects information from a variety of data sources, and it helps drive that collaboration and integrated workflow. I just talked about the prescriptive uh, abilities of KNET, you know, using the root cause analysis feature. KNET will be integrated with PlanFab Optics. So with, the, with that uh, ability of KNET, customers who are using PlanFab Optics are able to deploy more proactive maintenance strategy. Not just KNET. PlanFab Optics integrates analytics information from other analytic solutions, such as AMS Device Manager, analytics which are embedded in device diagnostics, analytics which are embedded in our control system, such as Delta V. I talked about principles and data-driven analytics, so information gathered from KNET, PlanFab Insight, AMS Asset Monitor, and analytics which is embedded monitoring the rotating equipment our AMS Machinery Manager. Now, traditionally, this information was available in silos. PlanFab Optics, since it's integrating that information from multiple solutions, is helping to provide targeted insights to each of these personas to help them to make those decisions faster. In our next version of PlanFab Optics, we will be uh, introducing augmented reality. We will be adding data sources which are external to Emerson. And we will be enhancing the visualization part of PlanFab Optics so that the results can be viewed and delivered faster. Now, if our customers do not have the subject matter expertise, then Emerson also has the connected services offering to provide that analytics expertise for you. So regardless of the analytics application that you are deploying, Emerson is providing that solution framework for our customers to get answers out of their hidden data and make that available via PlanFab Optics. Thank you for your time, and now I'd like to call up on stage Anil Datu to talk about data management. Good morning. Um, my name is Anil Datu, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about the the new data management team within the Emerson Operational Certainty Consulting Group and some of the services and solutions that we deliver. So just to set the context on where data management fits within the larger plant web digital ecosystem, it fits within the consulting and implementation and secure connectivity subdomains. And our focus is to leverage Emerson's very large and very integrated portfolio of solutions and subject matter expertise to develop unified data management solutions. So firstly, just a little bit of a background on the data management team. So the data management team comes to Emerson through the acquisition of a company called iSolutions. Uh, iSolutions is a production data management consultancy that focuses on real-time data integrations from field and plant control systems, and then integrates that data into data, data historian, data management repositories, and exposes that data for real-time reporting for analytics, for visualizations, and for integrations into other corporate systems, systems like asset and reliability management, field data capture, production accounting, and environmental reporting systems. The team has both project delivery and lifecycle maintenance components, and what we find is that these managed service lifecycle components help us stay engaged within our client community throughout their project investment cycles. Data management is is part of the systems and data business enabler functions uh, that supports all the other business driver functions. So we feel that data management is a key component to all digital transformation projects within the different subcategories of the business driver functions, including safety and security, reliability, energy and emissions, supply and demand chain, and production. Our team is fully leveraged 
and our plan is to continue to leverage Emerson Salesforce, our integration partners, and our subject matter expertise to continue to deliver higher value added data management solutions. So the newly acquired services and capabilities uh, will, well, they extend Emerson's uh, existing capabilities and will help us access a different category within the existing user communities. So I wanna highlight a couple of the key capabilities that have come uh, with the data management team. Data historian expertise, so we have a very deep set of experience in designing, implementing, and supporting real-time data historian platforms, including tools like OSISoft Pi, Aspen Tech IP21, and Honeywell Uniformance. Another key uh, capability that we're adding is, is the ability to help our clients navigate cloud data migrations. So increasingly, our clients are asking for solutions that allow them to stream subsets of their data from their on-prem portfolios into cloud-based repositories for a deeper set of analytics that may not be available on-prem. And so we have a tool called Magnotics that allows users to take data from their traditional data sources, including SQL, OPC DA, UA, and HDA, MQTT, and Modbus, and stream that data to various cloud platforms, including Google Cloud Platform, Amazon Cloud, and Microsoft Azure IoT Hub. The team also brings a number of processes within a data management toolbox, including project execution plans, system implementation plans, um, historian migration and sizing utilities, and implementation procedures for acquisitions and divestitures. So as we move through an organization into the enterprise, we encounter users that are interested in increased visibility in, into real-time information that's integrated across all of their operations. And a data management platform and a data integration strategy are key components in helping to deliver this. Some of the key benefits of our solutions include improved work prioritization by enabling the timely delivery of the right data to the right stakeholders so that they can make the right decisions. Our solutions also allow clients to centralize and leverage higher value added staff functions within decision support centers for integrated operations of multiple field and plant remote sites. Our focus is very consultative, and I think Lal, Stewart, and Peter referenced that and highlighted that in their keynote yesterday. Uh, we hold initial discussions with our user community to evaluate their digital maturity level and understand their requirements. We then pivot very quickly into a design and proof of concept um, so that the client can, can validate the return on investment and the scalability of the technology. And we find that this agile approach allows us to very quickly pivot into fleet-wide implementations with our clients. One thing to note is that we maintain a vendor agnostic approach. So many of our clients are built through acquisitions and do not have standardization within their control environments. And so our data management solutions oftentimes become that standard layer that sits on top of all of their control environments for, for data integration and data access. So I wanted to highlight um, a key use case. I'll focus on the one on the far right. Um, this is a chemical manufacturing use case uh, where we're helping a client manage excursions in polyethylene quality by taking data from their manufacturing system taking data from their laboratory information management system, and taking data from operator narratives and operator logs, and streaming that data using our tool called Magnotics into the cloud, into an Azure IoT Hub cloud environment, and then allowing subject matter experts within the client organization to analyze that data to understand where feedstock and catalyst product qualities impact their end product quality of polyethylene, which is their focused product. So the key message I want to leave you with today is that you know, we believe data management is a key enabler in helping scale and deliver the implementation of digital transformation solutions. Thank you for your time. I'd now uh, like to invite Tom Bass up to discuss recent developments in wireless infrastructure. Great. Thank you. Good morning. My name's Tom Bass, and I have responsibility for wireless product management for Emerson. 
And this morning, I want to highlight three elements of wireless infrastructure that are critical to digital transformation success. <clears throat> These three uh, elements are just highlighted here within the plant web ecosystem. If you're familiar with this chart, you're probably going to expect me to start from the bottom of pervasive sensing and work my way up through analytics, but I'm actually going to start in the middle with secure connectivity. And the reason for that is because what I hope to show you is that the selection of the appropriate wireless infrastructure really forms the foundation for bringing your pervasive sensing data to your analytics. Next, I'm going to show how we're continuing to build on our Plant Web Insight portfolio with the addition of two new Plant Web Insight applications focused on infrastructure. And finally, how this infrastructure is really designed to help support the future of pervasive sensing as we develop new technology. When we look at wireless in the industrial automation space, we've really seen a massive deployment of wireless over the last 12 years. With that long history of wireless development, we've also seen the choices for wireless protocols continue to increase. So the question for all industries really looking to plan for the future is which wireless protocol should they invest in? So we're showing here a few of the high-level selection criteria, and I just want to go through a couple of those. The first is that the solution that's selected must fit within the existing security architecture within the facility today. Next, the infrastructure must be future-proof, and it must also be flexible enough to deploy within the diverse system architectures we see in our facilities globally. So since there is no single wireless protocol in existence today that, that is perfect solution for every application for every industry, what we typically see is it's broken out into a field and a plant network. And the reason for this is because I think there's unique features for each network to, to efficiently deploy those solutions and really work seamlessly together. If we focus on a few of those that are really for industrial automation, we can see that there are a few that are common across the field and the plant network. Those include security, reliability, interoperability. Those are common between those two protocols. What drives the separation, then, is when we really start to look at the unique features, and I've highlighted those in orange and blue, and I want to highlight just a couple of those. Starting with the field network, update rate of the field device is incredibly important. As we look at supporting things like pressure relief valve monitoring, where some applications might need a four-second update rate, while others may be eight seconds or longer. For the plant network layer, data rate is incredibly important. As we look to support high data rate applications like video backhaul, and mobile worker. When we break these protocols down into these unique industrial automation features, we really end up with leading protocols in the applications that they were designed to support. What's important is that those protocols work efficiently together, which is why we're excited to be continuing our long history with Cisco to deliver our next generation of wireless access point. This solution brings together the leading field and plant network protocols to enable pervasive sensing and analytics within the facility. And these aren't just asset-specific analytics. Today we're announcing two new additions to our Plant Web Insight portfolio for a total of nine total Plant Web Insight applications today. Now these applications are unique in that they offer infrastructure analytics. The first is a power module management app. This provides instant access to all the power modules within an enterprise. The next is a network management app that enables a site to manage all of their wireless networks and ensure things like firmware are up to date on all of, those, all of those gateways. So these apps build on our strong wireless infrastructure and ensure that the facilities are enabled for pervasive sensing. We continue to build on our pervasive sensing portfolio. What I'm showing here is 21 different categories, and today I'm excited to be highlighting three more new technologies. The first is location awareness. We launched this, introduced this one year ago today at this event, and we're excited to be able to show you a live demo of location awareness at our booth in the exhibit hall this week. The second is expanded capabilities of our toxic gas monitoring solution. We're adding carbon monoxide and oxygen depletion sensors to that portfolio. And then third is a brand new uh, wireless vibration monitoring solution that I'm showing you here which builds on our existing wireless vibration monitoring solution. And you can learn more about this in the, in the booth in the exhibit hall this week. So all of these technologies are enabling new use cases. Two of specific are location awareness and mobile worker. Location awareness is built on the wireless heart infrastructure 
and enables things like mustering, geofencing, and safety alerts. While Mobile Worker is built on the plant network infrastructure, enables things like control system information and maintenance information in the field. So as the industry looks to build on use cases like I've shown, it's important to understand that investing in the appropriate infrastructure really forms the foundation for digital transformation success. And with that, I'd like to invite Brian to talk to you a little bit about upstream oil and gas applications. Good morning, it's great to be here. I'm Brian Lamott. I'm responsible for the technology organization within Remote Automation Solutions. And I'm here to geek out with you, as Peter references, about upstream oil and gas and the digital transformation that we're going through. It combines cloud SCADA platform with the data management and consulting services along with digital twin. The unconventional production industry is under tremendous pressure right now because of the sustained periods of low oil prices. Capital efficiency, operational efficiency are critical for survival, along with the challenges that we have of retiring workforce and leaner crews. The industry is looking to companies like Emerson to be able to develop new solutions in this space. This is where we get to geek out. The benefits to producers are around extending the productions through the life cycle of the well based on predictive intelligence, empowering the workforce with safer, less in, with safer operations and less windshield time, making the right decisions using the right data provided to those with the specific roles at the right time. Emerson is addressing these challenges by building the leading integrated solution and capabilities for the upstream oil and gas industry. We've already heard today about the investment made in data management and analytics, the strong analytics with KNET. We've also brought significant new capabilities in upstream to our customers with the acquisition of Paradigm Software Business two years ago unmatched in the industry around the digital twin for doing monitoring of wells and monitoring of the well interaction amongst each other. We're excited today to announce the integration of the ZI Cloud SCADA business that brings an uncompromised solution, the largest scale that we have in the industry, with over 6,000 users, 2, 000, um, 2 million excuse me, sensors being monitored, all in the oil and gas industry. This complements the existing automation systems that our customers may have. We do data collection from the intelligent data devices. The service bus is able to take that information, process it, and hand it off to the other systems that it require it including the analytics, data connectors for the existing systems, and the Emerson Analytics por portfolio. It also includes a mobile platform to be able to provide the information and analytics and the results of those to the users, again, role-based and in the field. Two examples, and these build on each other. First is frac hits. You may not have heard of frac hits, but in conventional wells, you, you drill um, purely vertical. You reach the oil, and the pressures have it come up. In unconventional, you have to do horizontal drilling. So you first drill the well down, and then you horizontally go sideways, and it won't free flow because it's in shale. It's in tight formations. The oil is trapped. And so you have to go through a secondary process, which is the fracking process, to be able to unleash the oil from the rock formation. That process occurs at different layers within the sediment. The first time you do it, you don't have to worry about a frack hit because there isn't anything else to interfere with. 
the next layer up, when you do a frack, you can ha cause um, irreplaceable damage to the first well, the parent well. To be able to detect this, we're using a combination of analytics and the cloud SCADA system to be able to provide real-time data to the model and warn the frack crews to stop or assess prior to continuing on so that you don't have the frack hit. It can save millions of dollars to prevent the frack hit from occurring. The second example on gas lift optimization um, continues on where the frack hits left off. So it's a free-flowing well. It, there's enough pressure that it's um, bringing the oil up to uh, the surface. At some point during the life cycle, because of the decay, they're going to have to convert over to artificial lift. There's two key elements of this. One is when to convert over. The second one is at what pressures to inject the natural gas to build up the pressures to continue on the flow of oil. With the Paradigm K solution, we can model this with the digital twin and be able to determine both aspects, when to switch over and in real time which pressures to use based on the cloud SCADA system's real-time data. With that, the cloud um, uh, SCADA system augments the automation systems that are available today within the customer base, combined together with the data management and analytics, and we're able to have solutions for, that are point-based and that can satisfy what the customer's needs are. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it over to Derek Thomas. He'll step through machine automation, the digital transformation. Thank you. Nice, thank you. <clears throat> All right, good morning. Well, you've heard some of my colleagues <clears throat> tell some great stories about how Emerson is driving digital transformation in process industries. But now I want to talk to you a little bit about how Emerson is expanding the plant web vision into the machinery space. Emerson's a leader in process control, and our plant web digital ecosystem has transformed the way customers deliver performance improvement. This past February, as Peter mentioned, Emerson added a critical new piece to our capabilities and our technology portfolio with the acquisition of GE Intelligent Platforms. With this business, we gained important new capabilities and expanded our control system portfolio into machine control and the ecosystems around PLCs and industrial PCs. This acquisition makes us more capable as a company of serving machinery applications and end-to-end -end plant automation across discrete and hybrid, as well as balance of plant and islands of automation in the process world. Combined with our existing capabilities, we are able to bring plant web digital ecosystem, and digital transformation to an even broader set of customers, applications, and markets. Because today's manufacturers are faced with modernizing legacy equipment and control systems that were designed long before today's IoT vision. And these manufacturers face two primary challenges when optimizing these plants. Most of these machines were designed to perform a specific function, produce a good, you know, that's their output. And they, they were designed without full vision of the plant model. And what that means is they were designed without the flexibility to adapt to what's going on upstream or downstream, aside from saying, I'm blocked or I'm starved. Similarly, those factories, those same factories, are comprised of machines that were bought and installed over many years, many vintages, many suppliers, different standards and specs. So these manufacturing plants end up with a large variety of PLCs that could be from different suppliers, different generations, or different programming tools, and a lot of legacy equipment that wasn't designed to produce data. They're just designed to produce a good. So when we talk to our customers, they ask us, how can I gain a better view of the plant that connects all of these islands of machines, all of these islands of automation, and how can I access all that trapped data that's in those machines? How do I extract that out of the PLCs that are out there so I can get better insights and make better decisions? Because achieving digital transformation requires a keen ability to see deeply and broadly across an operation. So Emerson now is uniquely positioned to help with those challenges with our broadened portfolio of fit-for-purpose control solutions that can operate at any level within a plant 
in any scale. Truly something that's unique in the industry. And with this acquisition, we gained new capabilities and expertise in discrete machine control, machine edge control, interfaces, devices, and software. And this is a business that has a long history centered around the idea of connectivity. In early innovators and many technologies that are commonplace to us today. Thinking about how, how all of these devices interface with each other to meet the demands of today's industrial automation and control systems. So we have a comprehensive portfolio that enables us to, to deliver complete industrial automation and control with innovative high performance solutions that deliver industry leading ruggedness and reliability that our customers demand. But there's more to it. Because today's customers are thinking about how do I control at the edge? How do I deliver that analytics? Well, continuing that transition of innovation, we've set a new industry bar for how you can harness the power of control at the edge. We're bringing data processing down to the machine layer in a safe and secure way and connecting it directly with real-time deterministic control so that as actions are happening in the machine or on your production line, you can directly analyze that data and optimize your production right at the point of use, right at the time it happens. We've created a new generation of controller with what we call our outcome optimizing machine edge controller. It's made possible by hypervisor technology. So we've combined logic and applications in one device and one processor. Other solutions that are out there in the market might require two devices or two processors. And that adds complexity, cost, and failure points. So with our PAC systems runtime, we can run real-time logic, rules, calculations, and other traditional PLC tasks on one side of this device in the middle. And then in parallel with our PAC edge stack, we can run data processing, create dashboard, log data, or even remotely monitor the machines, all in a reliable way, and all while ensuring the deterministic engine always stays up and running, regardless of what's going on on the application side. We talk to customers about this, and what they tell us is you can realize 7% productivity improvements by optimizing your machines on the fly, 22% productivity gains by better planning and predicting when events can happen, and a 40% reduction in maintenance by better planning your maintenance schedules and predicting those failures through trending and looking at the analytics. So this is exciting technology for us as we think about delivering the power of IoT right at the machine edge. And there's more to come from Emerson with this acquisition because we're accelerating investments in integrating and expanding this portfolio to further serve our customers. We're going to be working on integration of this portfolio with Delta V Innovation, enhancing our range of controllers and edge devices, expanding with new PAC motion servo, I.O., industrial displays, and safety devices that make us more complete, and then new capabilities for services, training, support, and projects. So we plan significant investments over the next few years in people, products, and services to help a new set of customers achieve digital, digital transformation. I want to thank you for the opportunity to share how Emerson is extending the reach of PlantWeb through our newest capabilities in machine control. And now I'd like to welcome Brad Buddy, who's going to talk about how Emerson is transforming the way our customers work through our new digital, personalized digital experience. Thanks, Derek. Uh, my name is Brad Buddy. I lead the Digital Customer Experience Program for Automation Solutions. I'm going to shift directions a little bit from talking about the digital transformation our customers are going through, as Derek said, into what we're doing within Emerson Automation Solutions to digitally transform ourselves and the way that we interact with our customers and the way that our customers work with us. Well, why, uh, why are we doing this? First of all, expectations are changing and digital is enabling those new expectations. Remember back in the day when we used to hear about US households watching too much television four or five hours a day that the TV was on? Digital's changed that. Now what we're hearing about is the US, average US adult is spending 6.3 hours with digital media. It's a completely different conversation and they have different expectations. We find that same kind of trend happening in e-commerce, percentage of e-commerce retail sales continues to increase. And why is that? Because we as consumers expect speed, we expect broad range of options and choice, and we don't have time to spend running errands any longer. Those expectations that we're all going through personally at home are now being brought to work, and our customers are telling us that. 
what we're finding is that 87% of our B2B or business to business customers are expecting those same consumer experiences in the office and at work. Customers tell us that the number one pain point they have generally working with suppliers is, is the lack of speed. And then lastly, 86% of B2B users prefer a self-service personalized tool to complete their tasks and conduct business. I find that to be especially true with engineers who are a bit introverted. We've been doing this for some time within Emerson, and we've learned that there are three key personas who, who are really getting value out of these digital capabilities. Engineers, for example, are working more with digital CAD drawing downloads. They're working more with engineering tools that are digitalizing so they can size applications and select products more easily. Procurement managers and procurement departments are looking for digital to create operational efficiencies within their enterprises. And plant, plant technicians, are digitalizing the way that they do work so they're more informed when they go out to sites, so they have mo they're using mobile tools, they're using digital processes and workflows to execute their work. So the difference or the change here is this offline work processes are moving online for the benefits of improved collaboration, speed, and productivity. In reaction to that, we at Emerson are announcing My Emerson as a personalized user experience. We've had this capability now for a few months, and we we're just rolling it out publicly. We already have 7,000 active users within My Emerson, our customers. And I'm going to take you through what this is and how, uh, how we're creating a seamless experience, beginning in the top right, and we'll work clock, uh, clockwise around this, this circle. First of all, it's My Workspace. We're engineers are able to work with a breadth of products that Automation Solutions provides so they can size products, they can configure model numbers or part numbers and put those products together in a list, collaborate with their peers, other engineers in their enterprise, collaborate with Emerson on those solutions and our channel partners, and, uh, and then build out lists of solutions for applications. They can then seamlessly take that information and share it with their procurement department in My Transactions, where those procurement agents are seeing lead time information. They're helping to plan the project. They're seeing information specific to their account, like order history, which is, by the way, not just those orders that they placed online, but all, also orders that are available online and the history, with the history they've had with Emerson. That information then is moved seamlessly to My Assets, or a digital installed base where our customers can see those assets that they've purchased. They can see the, uh, the assets that we've done in, uh, that we found in walkdowns using our mobile app. And they can use that information to, uh, to better uh, find content for product manuals, spare parts, or repair and service. Moving over to the left, my software. As our portfolio of software as a service continues to expand, it's important for our customers to be able to find the front door to that software. And my Emerson is a place where they can do that. My training is a capability to see the full product catalog of training that Emerson offers, where you can then choose to take that training online or schedule offline um, training. And then lastly, my preference is a place is, is a place where you can set your account information. You can also then identify the types of content you want to receive regularly from Emerson specific to you or your industry or your language. So together this whole experience is being built out to be seamless, is being built out to be one place where you can go get all this information. To take that, or take that theory into practicality, what we've shown you here is an example of those same six elements for a logged in user on the left side of the chart. You can see my preferences on top, my workspace below that, and then the rest of the elements there. This is the kind of experience that a logged in customer will find as that single place to do their work. The right side of this example is our digital installed base capability. If you make your way down to the technology exhibits, we have over 400 assets which are tagged with QR codes. Take out your, um, your Apple phone, open your camera, and uh, you'll get a link to jump right into that digital experience and see that demonstration. In this particular case, you're seeing a specific content and information around that flow asset. And in this example, you're seeing the whole of the products that we have down in the technology exhibit rolled up by lifecycle status and by device types. So it's not just important to have that singular personal experience, it's also important to be able to collaborate with your peers. And so we're showing you an example here of how that might work. Start at the bottom where we've installed 
a wireless pressure gauge uh, for pump seal monitoring, and we're also using uh, the Point Web Insight app. Once we realize the high ROI that that particular solution provides to a customer, um, they can then decide to scale it across their enterprise. Using the digital experience, they can look at that My Assets information in the way that that solution was solved originally, take that information seamlessly into the My Workspace environment where they can collaborate with engineers, change any specifications they need to localize it, perhaps for thread types in their particular sites or certifications in other countries and world areas. Then that engineer, she can pass the information along to the procurement manager who can help plan for the delivery of those products by understanding the lead times and scheduled delivery dates and order histories. The procurement manager then communicates and coordinates with the plant technician to ensure successful delivery. That plant technician will then install it, possibly even leveraging Emerson to help them with the installation service. And then finally, the operations team updates their workflows, applies the analytics, and realizes that ROI at scale. The whole loop here that we're showing brings together the collaboration of operations, and all the other people who can work together using, using these digital tools in the My Emerson collaborative environment. We believe this is going to deliver the speed, and we believe this is going to deliver that uh, digital uh, expectation that we as consumers are bringing into the workplace. Since we've been doing this for some time, we've been talking with customers about the uh, quantifying the value it creates, and we have a couple examples here. The, the way that CAD drawings would work in the past, I'm sure you've seen this, Printed product catalogs sitting on shelves, many shelves of them. You have to go find the right catalog. You, uh, you pull out the information you find, and then you build a CAD drawing that fits the particular solution you found. In the new world, with digital capabilities, you can go to MyEmerson or Emerson.com, download that CAD drawing, and immediately import it into your CAD system, moving 93% faster than the old way. Engineering tools is the same way in a product data sheet. In the old world, you'd draw on the margins or a circle on an ordering table those things you want in the new way. You can build that part number or model number real time in a visual configurator. Procurement managers have been looking for efficiencies. Um, in the old way, they're passing information via email many times over in order to get a, all the complete uh, information they need for quotes and orders. In the new way, they can do that immediately online. And they're moving 92% faster. Looking at the way digital install base experience can help plant technicians in the old way, they'd look up a serial number and go to the manufacturer to try and get the information about the history of that device. In the new way, they can go to my Emerson, look up that serial number and get that content immediately. Our field service tools, uh, the field service solution we've been deploying is enabling technicians the right information they need, the right processes and the right training in advance of executing that service. And what we're finding is in the old way, our first time fix rate was 75%. With these new digital tools, our first time fix rate improves 10 points to 85%. So we're better executing service using digital tools. We think these quantified results are, uh, are proving the value that digital creates, and we're excited to roll out My Emerson more broadly. This is a new capability we'll continue to invest in. We think it's differentiated in the marketplace, and it's really an exciting job. With that, I'll hand it back to Peter, who's going to take us over the finish line. Okay, thanks very much, Brad. So, as you see, we continue to build out, add all kinds of great new capabilities into the Plant Web Digital ecosystem. Uh, we touched on the areas that you see highlighted there in pink, but we're happy to talk about or take any questions as we go forward on, on any of the other areas. Um, again, just to remind you of how the you know the this chart is laid out or structured. I talked about the data flow, but also. You know, we always talk about the digital foundation, and that came up in the uh, in the panel, excuse me, in the plenary yesterday. You know, when when Lal Stewart and myself were speaking, where we talked about, you know, how do we view this? Is it an evolution or a revolution kind of thing? And it's like, well, pretty much everyone has this nice digital foundation in place already of intelligent instruments and digital automation. You know, we view the Plant Web Digital Ecosystem and our digital transformation offerings as the set of stuff over there on the in the light gray where we're taking on all these new domains such as reliability, safety, and, and energy management. So if everyone could come up on the stage now, all of our presenters, uh, we're going to have uh, time for some Q&A. Uh, I actually think we finished up very nicely and left ourselves a, a good little chunk of time to do some Q&A. I don't know if we're going to be passing the football again today or the mic. Okay, yeah, we are. 
It's my nickname for it. So here's your, our esteemed panel of presenters. And uh, you can see there the, the topics, in case you couldn't particularly remember who was associated with which topic area you had as a question. So we need the bold, brave first questioner to step forward. Oh, we'll get two of them. Paul, OK. Here, I'm just having to see you first. This is for uh, Brian Bud. I zoned for a moment there. Did you say that I could get my own maintenance uh, history results uh, of instrumentation that's in service back into my Emerson so before I bought that thing again, I could see how it was holding up? In the future, yes. Uh, that's, uh, that development is on our roadmap. The ability to see service records within the my Emerson experience. Um, this question is for Brian. Uh, yesterday in the oil and gas forum, Jim from Oxy said that he needed to add a whole bunch of data scientists to his staff to uh, predict some of those, um, or those two particular uh, incidents that, that you described. Uh, and I didn't hear you mention that. So I know that in this business, we're, we're looking to kind of take the di data scientists out and let the engineers be able to do this, but he, he didn't seem to think that that was going to be the case. Uh, I'm looking for your opinion on that. Yeah, we have data scientists within Emerson that does this analytics, and there's both principle-based and data-based analytics that are performed in, in both of these solutions. So um, we would look forward to talking with him and, and interfacing to see what challenges he's seen in this space so that we could apply some of these techniques. Yeah. Well, yep. yeah. <laughs> but, but also, Brian, I think Paula's question is more around, are these canned solutions or do you see that you need people with these specific kind of more analytic skills to go in and do more of a bespoke solution or, or are these canned solutions that we, or do we expect engineers to handle on their own? Yeah, it starts with a base, but it then has to be customized. And where that customization comes in place is with our consultant services. Hi, a question for Tom. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more about the relationship with Cisco and the wireless products that are being developed? Um, in the context, I know um, Cisco is also developing products for other automation um, providers. So is this a kind of a, um, uh, an, an exclusive a agreement with, with Cisco in, in, in the sense that what they're developing from Emerson is unique to Emerson, or is it a kind of a, a common development that includes other automation vendors as well? Yeah, yeah good question. Um, we've had a long history of, of partnering with Cisco on, a, on these solutions. This next generation is not exclusive. Uh, it's very much a modular solution uh, that we've developed actually together uh, based on the request from our end users. So uh, what the module that we've created, um, while it fits seamlessly with the Cisco solution, uh, it is not, a, not exclusive, but it does build on our long history of, of partnership with them. So um, as we look forward to, to continuing to develop that, we see that as, as being important. Uh, this question is for, for Neil. When you presented the integrated digital twin for oil and gas, uh, it was many smaller, I would say relatively under the radar acquisitions over the last two or three years. Uh, could you talk about how that integration is going? Uh, it's always challenging to bring that many new products together into right. a solution. I don't think, uh, I didn't present the digital twin. Yeah, I think that was, Sorry. I can't remember who that was. I can take that one. Right. Um, so each of the uh, businesses that have been acquired has their areas of expertise, but what we're doing is at the industry solutions level, bringing that together. So there's a combination of consultants at that level, of sales folks at that level, and then the technology interaction at that level as well. So it's handled at the industry level. Hey, uh, this question's for uh, Derek, I believe. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you speak a little bit with the, the integration of the GE Intelligent Platforms uh, PAC software? I, I'm assuming, I guess, explain, I, 
the initial integration of that? Is it going to be more to bring that technology into PLC management and processing plants, or do you see this as a way to bring plant web into discrete plants, new markets for Emerson? Can you talk about at least your initial near-term approach with this? Sure. I think there's a, there's a near-term and a long-term. Certainly in the near term, there's immediate opportunities because of the strength that we have with our distributed control systems to go after those balance of plant applications and create that tight interconnectivity to help our, our customers uh, in, in those balance of plant and in some of the, the other spaces we play in. Um, as we look longer term and we look at the plays we have in food and beverage and life sciences and mining and then moving further into discrete, we're gonna continue to expand and develop uh, the plant web capabilities into those areas. Now we're already present there. We've, we've got a $2 billion install base that spans the broad ecosystem you know, that, that has been built over, over that almost 40 years. Um, so we're interacting with customers. You, know, you can see uh, in, in the uh, presentations going on, Nissan is here presenting on how they've been upgrading 9030s to RX3i. Uh, but in terms of the plant web digital ecosystem, that immediate opportunity is certainly in the process space, and then we'll, we'll refine that with new applications over the next three years. Um, a question for, um, for Derek. Um, I keep hearing a kind of different definitions about the edge. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the machine edge. Mm -hmm. Can you just put that into, into a kind of a context versus, say, the, the plant edge, for argument's sake? Is it the same edge or is it a different edge? The, the primary difference in the manufacturing space between the edges, you've got, like you said, the machine edge, the plant edge, and then the enterprise layer. The biggest difference is where your data source is. At the plant edge, you're typically pulling from a SCADA system or an aggregation of multiple machines together. So I'm a little bit diluted in the data there because I've got to have a certain amount of expertise and data coming out of the individual machines. So that's certainly there as you look at plants that are more connected. Our technology can play at either one. We have the connectivity to uh, historical SCADA systems, OPC UA, and cloud, but really what we're hearing more of and where we think we're differentiated, you can do that, that type of edge device is kind of an IPC essentially. What differentiates the solution I presented was when you bring in the deterministic PLC logic. That's what allows it to go on, on the machine itself. And traditionally you would have a PLC and an IPC trying to communicate together, two devices, two, two sets of complexity. By marrying that together, I can get that more efficient, I can reduce the complexity in the cabinet, and then I can get faster response because the data is just moving across the processor. So, so do you have one machine edge for the entire plant, or do you have a machine edge for each machine? We have scale that can go either way. We can go, we, ha we have smaller units that can go machine by machine, and then we can scale up all the okay. way to full. Yeah. So we've got a, a complete range of solutions. Okay, so you can just tailor we it. We can do to, both, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would add, Stephen, you know, one of the things that I think the, the exact, the term edge is one of those terms that was kind of invented, I think, in the beginning, just basically to mean not cloud by the <laughs> IT guys, okay, that were, you know, who had a perspective of, you know, here's a data center, here's where everything runs, it's up here. And it really means many, diff depending on who you talk to, it could mean, as Derek was talking about, physically there, right there at the machine, same thing is true when we talk about in the process industries. Monsi talked about our asset monitor solution, which we expect to be field mounted physically right out to the machine. But it also, to a lot of process folks, I think just means it's at the plant level, right? It's somewhere close to where the data is generated, typically inside of the control network in the OT world more than in the IT world. But the exact definition of edge is is like what that judge, the U.S. judge, said about uh, pornography one time. You know, he couldn't tell you exactly what it is, but he knew it when he saw it. And that's, uh, I think, where Edge has actually become. I have a question for uh, Monsi. Um, it's more rudimentary to help my understanding, but uh, you were talking about principles-based analytics, and that's not something I had heard before. Can you explain more what you mean by that or what kind of principles you're talking about? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so principles-driven analytics is based on theories, based on industry standard um, principles, um, ASME calculations, 
domain expertise, and knowledge. So when you are trying to analyze these well-understood asset types, you are taking into account these theories and these algorithms to come up with faults, to um, analyze different conditions that could happen to that asset. So that's what principles-driven analytics is. Following up on that, I, I applaud you guys for trying to combine data-driven and principles-based analytics. When you look at your most successful customers, is it engineers trying to learn the data science? Is it the opposite, or is it a combination? Are they creating a collaborative team between data scientists and engineers? Sure. And this is very similar to the question that uh, was asked before. When it comes to modeling, right, there are two aspects of it. One is the data science aspect, and another is uh, the subject matter expertise aspect, uh, aspect, the domain knowledge aspect. So, And what we are seeing is sort of a combination and marrying both of that together. Of course, you um, understand the data science uh, part, and these algorithms which are inbuilt in our software are helping you to find that pattern with the knowledge of the data science to build that model together. But then important to that is also the subject matter expertise and the domain expertise and the industry knowledge and the asset knowledge. And together is what you would get uh, you know, to come up with a model or trying to find a solution. But Matt, I think you're asking, what have we seen be more successful? The data scientist that tries to do the operational problem or the engineer that tries to become the data scientist? Is that, that's how I would paraphrase what you asked. I think it's a great question. Uh, we tend to work more with the operations people that know the data scientists. We have some specific individuals in our organization that are that way, that were deep domain experts that have made themselves into good data scientists. Coming more from that domain myself, I, of course, think that that was the more appropriate <laughs> way, you know, that, uh, that you would do it. But, you know, I, the opposite happens as well. Like you were speaking to, you said yesterday, to somebody who was a real data scientist from one of the customers, right? Yeah, absolutely. And had dropped down into learning more of the operational stuff that was going on. Absolutely, yeah. So, you know, she was a data scientist who uh, is very well-versed with algorithms, and she was trying to find patterns, but then what was missing was that domain expertise. So she was always relying on that operator knowledge, always, you know, getting in touch with them to understand uh, the problem that they were trying to solve. So, so after we settle this debate, we'll talk about what whether it's easier to teach an automation guy IT or an <laughs> IT guy automation, because that was the other one that also has gone on for many years. This is just a wireless question for Tom. Um, you know, the, the capabilities that you're adding in the apps and stuff, what protocols are those working over? Is it, you know, Wi-Fi, cellular, or combination of how many different protocols? Yeah, the, uh, the 21 different categories of pervasive sensing technology I showed, all of those are based on the wireless heart protocol. What do they then go over? Do they go for Wi-Fi yes. or do they? So uh, that, that is, uh, when we talk about integration then, so the, the wireless, pro wireless heart protocol then goes back to the gateway. And from the gateway then, we can take that out in any number of different applications. We've got 45,000 different networks with probably just as many different integration opportunities where you can take that back. Cellular, Wi-Fi, um, depending on the application. Um, once it's in the gateway from, once it, taken from the sensor to the gateway via wireless heart. Once it's in the gateway, you've got a lot of flexibility with how you can take that back. Yep. No one's stolen this yet, so I'll ask another question. Uh, th this is for, for Brad. Uh, many automation vendors today are starting to present themselves as exemplars of digital transformation. So I applaud you guys for doing that. Often it's sort of application-centric or service-centric. Uh, I haven't heard an automation vendor really talk about creating an internal data science team uh, often it's to serve the customers, but not to serve themselves. So as you're doing your internal Emerson work, I'd be interested to see if you've created a data science team focused on Emerson problems, and if you've learned anything from that. In, in my particular role, we have what we call a digital intelligence team, and we look at the user journeys and the workflows that our customers and Emerson are trying to accomplish, and we look for friction in those workflows, and so we solve for friction to make life easier for everyone. It's not nearly as deep as that data science conversation. <laughs> uh, right. So I can comment because I actually, I have been involved with some of our corporate folks and some of our corporate IT teams as they have evaluated different analytics platforms to apply broadly to enterprise level analytics for Emerson. Huh. Um, right now, I would say the majority area where it's focused, like a lot of people, is in manufacturing. 
not so much in the manufacturing or automation solutions products, but in our commercial and residential business where they make much greater quantities than we do. And a lot of the analytics and automation and kind of the life cycle design story where you start with, you know, the PLM story where you start with the 3D model and you actually can visualize the automated manufacturer. Uh, they're very deeply into doing that. Um, we've not done that in our products because the volumes in any given factory typically aren't that great because we manufacture all over the world to serve people in that part of the world from, from wherever, you know, so we have manufacturing in Europe, manufacturing in Asia, U.S., wherever. So in the end, uh, the, the opportunity from a pure dollar and cents part isn't as huge for us because the manufacturing itself isn't as big of a deal. Um, so we've not yet, I'd say, outside of manufacturing done like kind of customer analysis, other, you know, there's a lot been done with RPA, robotic process automation, where our finance team and everything is done, RPA kind of stuff. Um, but no, we, we are, as you pointed out, absent from having the, here's our poster child, you know, internal implementation of where we digitally transfer, transformed ourselves. I've been meaning to actually get with our commercial and residential guys and, and document one of those, because I know that's something we should have in our portfolio when we talk about this stuff as well. But uh, we thought it was more important, I think, in automation to focus on the customer experience, which is what Brad Steam's been doing. You know, everything that's been presented is, is very well organized within the plant web organizational chart. Maybe I'm looking at that too closely, but uh, a lot of the, you know, the users, the people on the plant floor have huge patchworks of all kinds of other, you know, legacy technology. There's all kinds of generic silicon coming in, people are trying to, you know, decouple and have complete openness and non-proprietary solutions. So then maybe any of the panelists, what are you guys doing to link and serve those folks as well? Well, that's where Anil comes right. in. So, <laughs> I think, um, um, you know, I, as I mentioned in the talk, you know, we, we try to maintain a vendor agnosticity in our solution development so that, you know, our platforms are able to connect to, to any control system, to any, to any device, right, within those layers um, and integrate the data up for a deeper set of analytics. Many of, our, many of our clients are built through acquisitions and have no standardization, so they have that exact problem that you're referencing. And we find that the data management layer, if it's built appropriately and they have a proper data integration strategy, that homogenized data management layer is really uh, the location of where you would kind of centralize um, the data and the analytics and the visualizations that you're addressing. Yeah, so the, although we present, I, I also just want to comment, I'm trying to go backwards if for the slides folks, if they can just take me back to the, to the digital ecosystem. I mean, we present this as, you know, this is obviously our portfolio filling the gaps, but it's really a generic representation of the capability and the functionality that needs to be done. And you can pretty much pick any piece. Right. You know, Tom talked about over 40,000 wireless sensor networks. Believe me, they're not all attached to Emerson automation systems, and we'd love it if they were, but, you know, but they're not, right? So they're, you know, widely integratable into other systems. Uh, KNET, you know, our analytics technology, I think, again, the majority of the install base of those installations are not on Emerson automation systems. They're connected into other people's automation, whatever it is they may have. Okay, uh, optics. You know, today we're connecting all of our internal asset applications that we have, our internal analytics applications, as Monsi showed. But the plan there, and we actually are showing some third-party integration. Just get started is to again reach out and connect to whatever the most popular uh, other third-party applications people have in the asset analytics space, right? So, yeah, we, we show it this way but uh, because this is our suite of stuff, but you can pretty much take any kind of piece in here and we're able to do it in the middle of someone else's already established automation solutions. And that's the reality of today, which is why having the integration services that, you know, Anil talked about is so important to be able to come in. Because when we talk about digital transformation, it's largely, in the context we're talking about now, it's a brownfield thing, right? We're going to install bases, sites that are already up and running. They're not going to 
would love them to, but they're not going to pull out a whole bunch of stuff that they've already got up and running to go with a with an Emerson, you know, top to bottom solution. I just had a question for Brad. Do you, would you be able to give a, an example or two about on the uh, the My Emerson system how the training a, um, aspect of it would work um, in terms of uh, you know like how someone would would use that tool? Sure. The um, the capability we plan to build out would uh, the user journey would flow something like this. A user would register online. They'd be granted access to this system. They would see our broad catalog of training. They'd be able to find that particular training element that they need in their career or the solutions that they're trying to solve in the near term. That product catalog then can be, some of elements of that can be um, taken digitally, anytime, anywhere, in multiple languages. And some elements of that then would, uh, they would sign up for face-to-face -face training at an Emerson location or through one of our education partners. So that combination of blended learning helps deliver either a thin layer of expertise or, or give them deep expertise in, in whatever skill they're trying to gain. We have a question oh, over there. We've got one more. Grace? Okay, yeah. we've got time for one, maybe two more, Peter, and then we gotta wrap it up. Okay. Thanks. Hi, uh, Peter, this is for you. Um, so m many of the audiences out there are looking for the, you know, the roadmap, the, the focus on how you start in all these areas where people could kind of jump in at different points, different kinds of applications. Do you envision having a, you know, how to get started and the roadmap for, you know, this various um, points where people could, um, you know, start their path? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, that was the focus last year that we talked a lot about was, uh, our operational con certainty consulting team and their ability to work with you to produce that roadmap. Uh, Anil's part of that group overall, so he's the part that does the data integration, but we have a set of other consultants whose job is to basically work through what are the highest business value opportunities at a given site where they ought to be focusing and where they should be making their first invest you know, investments. They bring a toolbox of, of like over 140 different very specific uh, what we call value improvement practices or what you might call applications that you could deliver. So customers that don't know about you know, what they might be doing, they can see this whole variety of things that others have done. But, but the process is fundamentally, you know, it's a business process of where is the biggest opportunity? What's your biggest problem? You know, do you want to tackle reliability? Do you want to talk or tackle energy? Do you want to tackle people mobility and getting information out? So we, we very much see that as a need and have a consultant group that tackles that. Well, thank you again, everyone. Before you leave, I just want to give a little shout out here to somebody who's been with us for a long time. It's Mr. Paul Studebaker over there, who uh, I've known for, for many years through, through two different major automation vendors, okay, as a career. Um, <laughs> is going to be retiring. We just heard this year from talking to him at dinner. So let's all, you know, Paul, we're going to miss you. You've been a very familiar and constant uh, presence here at these events and for many years and a, and a big voice in our industry overall and in the, in the media. So thanks for all your years of sticking with us here in the automation space, and we wish you the best in your retirement. So... So enjoy the rest of uh, the conference. Um, again, make sure you get down to the exhibition. Make sure you see the digital transformation experience. Uh, that brings it all together in one place. It's always, a, it's always good to see that from that perspective rather than you know, just sitting here and talking about it on the PowerPoint charts. So thanks again, everyone, for coming. Hopefully see you next year.